we're going to be talking about America's favorite fruit or vegetable, the tomato. I love to eat tomatoes. I love to grow tomatoes. I love to talk tomatoes. So the tomato, if you ask a botanist, it's a fruit. But because we use it in so many savory foods, we think of it as a vegetable. Regardless, fruit or vegetable, it's wonderful to have in our diets. High in vitamin A and a strong source of lycopene, which is a powerful antioxidant for good health. Well, I don't need to convince you, the audience, of why you want to eat a tomato. What we want to talk about is growing them in your garden. Many gardeners would say, if I only have one tomato that I can grow, one plant that I could grow, it would be a tomato. And the reason is, if you look at the study that was done by um, recently by Washington State Extension, they said, what is the difference between one you grow in your garden and one you might buy in the store? And they looked at the differences in quality, production, and value. As far as quality, they rated it very high, that it's far superior to anything bought in the store. As far as production per square foot, that is the length of time and work of growing them, they said it was still superior to a store-bought and relative monetary value definitely far superior to what you buy in the store. So it's worth planting your and growing your own tomatoes. In order to help you be successful this year, we are having three seminars. The first today uh, is going to focus on helping you to choose the variety that you want, the options to starting it from seed and early care of seedlings. Then in about five weeks, we'll talk again about tomato varieties because there may be some of you who wish to just buy yours from a nursery and have a seedling. Whether it's your tomato you've started or one you've purchased, we wanna talk about how you're gonna manage the growth of that seedling. Uh, and we stress the, the uh, technique of potting up, which will help to develop strong roots. So we get them ready to plant out in the garden soil. And then May 3rd, we're gonna help you recognize how you want to start planting them into the garden. It may be too early at that point, but you could be planning and thinking about it, getting your garden ready and learning about the cultural practices and management to help minimize any risk of disease or uh, pest. And we'll go take you right through the end of the harvesting season to a success with our, uh, with our uh, information. Well, the objectives of today's class, first of all, if you're going to pick out a tomato, what would you grow with? The easiest way to do is learn the classification and all the varieties that are available and how to select them. It said there's over 10,000 different varieties and cultivars of tomatoes. So it could be overwhelming to think about what do I want to grow? Well, also we will talk about the advantages, benefits and challenges of growing from seed and knowing when and how to start a tomato from seed. We'll also need to understand the effects of light, temperature and moisture on the seeds. How best to manage them to have successful germination and growth. We'll want to understand the effects of light, temperature and moisture, and then also to be able to choose a garden location for transplanting later in the season. So with these 10,000 varieties, how do we choose? Well, what does it mean for the use? That's the main thing to look at. We're gonna look at how a scientist would uh, classify tomatoes by genetics, by the growth pattern, and by their shape. By genetics, we're gonna talk about heirloom versus hybrid. Now an heirloom tomato, if you think about heirloom of any object, it's uh, been handed down from generation to generation. For the tomato, it's an open pollinated, handed down, and you can count on planting that seed from that tomato each generation as it will result in the very same plant, the very same tomato. And that's why it has been able to hand it down generations after generation. Then there's the hybrid tomato. And this has been uh, a crossbred, two different types of tomatoes for parents that have good qualities. And when they combine them, they uh, work towards finding a tomato that is even a better tomato, more disease resistant, better yields, higher production. The thing to remember is the seed production then is not true to the original plant. 
Um, some people feel a, a hybrid sometimes uh, plant can be sacrificed the flavor. Uh, I don't know that that's always true, but it depends on the particular variety maybe you're looking at or the cultivar. Uh, it's generally the supermarket tomatoes are generally considered to be hybrids uh, because they've been bred to travel long distance and sit on a supermarket shelf. You'll often hear uh, the terms variety and cultivar used uh, and they are used interchangeably, but they are not the same. And I'll just take a minute here and, and describe that. When we hear talk about a variety of plant, those are what occur natural in nature. Uh, they're true to type. Seedlings from the parent have the same characteristics. So that would be an heirloom. When we speak of cultivar, that word is coined from the terms cultivated variety. These are plants that have been selected and cultivated by humans, and they produce a different plant than the parent. Uh, so reproduction is done then by propagating or grafting. So we have the terms heirloom and hybrid. Also I want to talk a little minute about a grafted. The grafted plant is a combination of a vigorous rootstock and a scion, which is grafted on the top. So this could be one of your favorite uh, heirlooms that is a little difficult to grow. And when it's grafted onto a vigorous rootstock, it is driven to a production that is far superior to what the original conventional plant had. It can be more disease resistant. I've often harvested four to five times the amount of tomatoes from a grafted that I did from a conventional. Um, they are expensive to buy and very, very difficult to, to graft, but uh, you will see a difference in the disease and the production. And if you try to save the seed, it'll go back to the original cyan that was grafted. Well, in addition to genetics, we want to consider maybe the growth pattern of the plant. Um, and that was basically can be identified the length of time it takes to produce and the structure of the plant. So there's two different types in this category, the determinate and the indeterminate. Of course, the word determinate means it's just a very uh, determined time that it will grow and ripen and be done and the size it will get to. Uh, so it's more of a bush. You see here one that's in a pot on a patio. Uh, this crop is re ripening all, much, all in the same time with a very short time of two to three weeks. It's an excellent type of a tomato to grow for canning because your crop will come uh, on quite a bit at the same time, making it easier to, to harvest. It's a good plant to grow in a pot because it is a bush. You don't need to stake it usually. And you can see that the, the, the stems end with a fruit cluster and they're spaced very close together. So they're very, very dense. Now contrast that with an indeterminate, which instead of being a bush is more is a vine and it will grow and grow and grow until frost. Uh, and it'll, you can harvest it over a longer period of time. It will need staking because as you can see how large it is. Um, the overall yield is generally higher, but con here it is a good contrast. The determinant, everything's ripe and ready to pick. It's a small bush. Here's the determinant. It's grown high, would need to be staked. Um, you see some ripe tomatoes, some that are starting to ripen, some that are small, and here up here are blossoms yet to even be uh, uh, pollinated and grow. So this is a long-term crop here. So the deter indeterminate, uh, the stem ends with another shoot. That's why it just keeps growing and gets so large. The fruit clusters are spaced apart. And uh, for that reason, I think sometimes the fruit seems to taste better. It seems to get a little more sunshine. There's more leaves. So therefore you're gonna have more photosynthesis, which results in more sugars. Uh, and more leaves sometimes can help keep the plant a little healthier uh, because there's more leaves before it actually defoliates. Well, another consideration is selecting it by the shape. And this is basically as how do you want to use your tomato crop? There's the shape called the globe, which I think can refer to the, the slicer. There's the beefsteak, paste, and cherry. Let's start by talking with the cherry. It's such a popular uh, type of tomato. These are often called the patio or pixie tomatoes. They're wonderful for salads or just plain eating out of the garden. Um, I've grown most of the ones I've seen, I've seen listed here for you. They're wonderful uh, and just so versatile, as you can see the beautiful colors. Uh, a, a mutation of the cherry has resulted in the grape and the pear cultivars. <clears throat> They're usually a meatier, chewier texture. 
little different shape, lots of different colors. Uh, sometimes the flavors are described as slightly tart. The current tomato, so named because it's so small, like a little current, is an indeterminate, uh, highly disease resistant, high yielding, high sugar content, uh, firm, juicy texture. Uh, that might be an interesting one to try. It's very, very sweet. Uh, Oregon State has a publication that lists the cultivars. Uh, here you see the cherry and grape. And you're going to notice that these, these are the tomatoes that ripen the earliest. Here's some early ones to mid-season. This is just a few. Uh, some are determinate, semi-determinate, different colors. But you will see uh, your earliest ripening are the cherry tomato cultivars. Then there's the paste. For those of you who like to make salsas and sauces, uh, it's a wonderful tomato. It has uh, more meat, less, less juice. And so it can be uh, put into those uh, sauces or dried much easier. Here's a few popular varieties. San Marzano and the Amish paste or Blue Beach. They're wonderful tomatoes. Here's a, also another chart from Oregon State on the cultivars. Uh, you'll notice some of these uh, the, are the, on this particular chart is a parthenogy. Parthenocarpic, which means it's seedless, that's developed by uh, Oregon State University. Again, you see I have a few that are early and some mid, some determinate. Uh, these are some of the slicers. Or, uh, wonderful for sandwiches and salads, uh, an easier tomato to harvest and, and the size is quite manageable. A couple of these, again, also have no seeds developed by Oregon State. Santiam and Silets. Slicer tomatoes, there's a nice, nice variety of these to grow. Again, you're going to see that the tomato gets larger, then the maturity comes later. Some of these are mid-season, some late. Now, the beefsteak, of course, is one that people love to enjoy bragging about. This is a big Zach which is a nice big tomato. They do harvest the very latest, takes the longest to grow a large tomato. And they can be used for slicing, salads, sandwiches, pretty well fills a hamburger bun and overlaps sometimes. Here's a picture of some of the heirloom beefsteaks. Lots of varieties, lots of wonderful tastes. Well, we've talked about scientific ways of choosing them, but you know, another way to pick a tomato is just from what you like and what your neighbor says tastes best. And so it's in the past, it's been kind of a subjective thing about which is the best tasting tomato. But I recently read about the use of the BRICS test. Now that the BRICS test is an acronym for a, uh, a test that is applied to grapes uh, by the wineries to check the sugar content. And so they've been now checking tomatoes and saying which tomatoes have the highest BRIC test uh, results. The higher the score on the BRICS test, the higher the number, the sh then the higher the uh, number of sugars are present in the fruit. And that's been an indicator of vegetable quality. Now, if you compare the scores, here's another uh, reason to grow your own. Look at the score of the store-bought tomatoes between three to five and look at homegrown cherries. cherries. 12 to 13. Cherry tomatoes do have the highest tomato score on the bricks. Indeed, viva la difference. Well, maybe you're still not sure uh, which one to want to pick because what really matters to you is how long does it take to mature? Maybe you want to plan a vacation or you want to plan some to can and you need to know who, which one's going to be ready when you want it ready. So look at the that it consider the days of maturity. They can go all, uh, quite a broad span from 50 days for an early girl. A larger mortgage lift or a beefsteak might take 80 to 90 to days. Or maybe you're concerned about disease or problems in the garden and you say, I don't want to be spraying. So maybe I want one that's really disease resistant. And you can find that also with your tomatoes. What you're going to do now is check the seed packet because the seed packet will tell you which one is resistant to the following diseases. And you'll see these letters on the seed packet. 
We'll talk a little bit about some of these diseases in the third session of my tomato webinars. Well, you're still wondering whether you want to start from seeds? Well, do you want to sow the seeds or do you want to buy the seedling plant? Let's compare. The seeds, the availability is absolutely the greatest. Uh, you'll have, especially from the catalogs, you'll find thousands of tomatoes that are available through this through if you plant the seeds still pretty good from the seedling plants generally not quite as many as available if you're itching to get started early you can start with seeds however if you don't want to you can start later when you just buy the plant the cost is the lowest if you're going to buy seeds uh, it's still cheaper to buy a seedling plant than to buy the tomatoes in the store but it is more expensive there's way more varieties with seeds versus what you're going to buy because you're limited to what the nursery wanted to plant. And you have this, the joy of raising a plant from seed to harvest. Some hybrids are disease resistant. Maybe you want to choose the seedling. Whichever, let's get started. And today we'll talk about starting from seed. So first one, research your needs and the preferences and the information that we talked about, how to choose it. That'll be one of the things you'll want to consider. Then when you've made your decision, you want to purchase the seeds. And again, you can use a catalog. They're wonderful to get in the mail or you can request them online and look, you may go just to your garden store and buy them. There's also county, many counties have seed libraries that you can visit to pick up seeds. When you pick up that seed packet, it's good to look at it and understand what it's telling you. First of all, it tells you the variety. This pack is a San Marzano, the use, it's a sauce or a paste tomato. The growing pattern, it's an indeterminate. The harvest time is 90 days. So that's the information on the front of the pack. Then if you turn it over, there's more information for you. It'll tell you the year it's packed. And generally these seeds are good for about two to three years. So those seeds, this pack is still good for this year. It'll tell you when to sow it indoors, six to eight weeks before uh, transplant date how to plant it it tells you the depth and the soil temperature and the days to germinate all this information and then it tells you when to thin the plants tells you how to uh, this one is and most and tomatoes are for the, our area are not recommended to plant indoor or to sow in outside in the garden for as a seed tells you about fertilization the viability of the seed and the germination rate information as you're buying those tomato seed packets. So you've got the, you decide what you want, you bought the seed packet, now it's time to say, well, what are the materials that I need? Does it matter what I plant the seeds in? Yes, it does. You're going to say, can I use garden soil or potting mix? No. You need a special product called a seedling medium. The seedling medium uh, is much lighter in uh, potting soil is too dense. So if you're shopping for it, it may be called a germinating or a seed starting mix. It is a blend of peat moss or coconut coir, perlite, calcium silicate, and a wetting agent. The seedling mix maximizes the potential for the seeds to germinate. Potting soil is too dense and garden soil is way too dense and may contain pathogens and weed seeds. So they've got your, your seedling mix and now you're gonna get, what are you gonna put it in? Let's start with a traditional way of putting it into a tray. You wanna start with a small pot, one to three inches at the, at the largest or maybe even a tray with cells. You're going to plant it in something very small and then it will need to be repotted up several times. And this is a good practice because it helps with root development. Now I'm gonna talk briefly about use some, a different system than using plastic cell trays. You know, our ancestors didn't have plastic and so they made cell blocks when they were just gather a bunch of soil together and put the seed in that to get it started. The seedling mix in uh, when we use soil blocks is both the container and the growing medium. There's no plastic containers. And the phenomenon called air pruning, which we'll talk about, eliminates a pot bound plant. Soil blocks can lead to remarkable health of transplants compared to their cousins grown in cell trays. Well, what does a soil block look like? Well, it's made from a tool that looks like this. 
it's a it has a comp four little uh, compartments there that you're going to press the soil meeting in, into and pack it tight it has on the underside these protrusions that make holes in the soil for the seed to go into you can see there's large soil blocks and small and even a homemade one well briefly you're going to make a if you're going to make a soil block you mix the planting medium you get it very very wet almost dripping wet you fill those little soil blockers and then pack them in tight place it on a bottom tray and release it it has a spring on it on the handle and then the, the soil will, blocks will come out when we make soil blocks we use these following six items uh, of course peat moss or coconut guar Perlite, worm castings, a blended cow manure, lime, and a mixture of equal parts blood meal, phosphate, and green sand for a fertilizer. The mixture needs to be wet, really wet, and uh, it's best to use a warm water and pack very densely while it's wet. You're going to mix it uh, one part water for every three part mix, and it, a lot of the success of having it hold together is it needs to be wet enough. When you make, make them, then you're going to put the blocks onto an open tray. You're going to water from the bottom. And a seed doesn't have to be carried, covered. You're going to put the seed into it. And you'll place it on the heat mat and then begin hydration. There's the germination is complete. Uh, and you'll take the cover off when it goes to like this and keep it under the grow lights. Let's talk just a little bit about air pruning. Why is it better? If you blow, if you grow in a soil block, it gets a really stronger root system. Uh, there's more oxygen that's to the roots and it naturally prunes. What that means is that uh, there's, it doesn't hit the sides of the plastic and then go around and around. It reaches the edge of the soil and just stops. Reaches that edge and it'll stay there until uh, it's placed in more soil and then it will continue to grow. So you don't have a root bound or a pot bound plant it's also i think favorable because it's a more sustainable way to grow from seed you don't have plastic containers and you're noticed by the next mixture that i gave the recipe for that has a lot of soil nutrients uh, that are that even your soil mix them doesn't have well just something to think about um, in all of your planting is that Coconut coir is renewable. It's a byproduct of food industry and pH neutral. Peat moss is more acidic, difficult to rewet, and the most important thing is obtained by strip mining. So it is a product that is, um, according to Linda Brewer, who wrote an article at Oregon State University, it contributes to climate change when we change when we harvest peat moss. So I think next time, if you want to start looking at the products you're buying, look to see if they have peat moss as a huge ingredient or to see if you can find any products that maybe have the coconut coir as a substitute. Last thing I'll say about it is a quote by Elliot Coleman, who's written a lot on organic gardening and he is a, has developed a lot of techniques on soil blocking. He says it's an ingenious seed starting method that allows the grower to produce vigorous seedlings with roots that quickly reestablish growth upon transplanting. Soil blocking further eliminates the expense, waste, and storage issues associated with plastic pots. Well, whether you're going to plant in plastic pots or soil blocks, the main thing to get now is we need to decide when are we going to start. So the guidelines for starting to plant from your seeds, and this is from a handout by 10 Minute University, we advise counting back from the local last frost in your region and you estimate five to seven weeks before that, that last frost. Now, when the Willamette Valley, that's usually the first couple of weeks of May uh, is when the last frost is. So the middle of March is a good time to start planting the seeds. Um, if you're not in the Willamette Valley, as many of you viewers aren't, um, you'll look at your National Climate Data Center for your inf information about your frost in your area. What materials do we need? Well, optimally, it would be nice to have a controlled heat mat and uh, thermostatically controlled and a grow light and a greenhouse, but that isn't possible for everybody. So let's talk about how we can uh, grow them using a, a variety of methods. Start with your uh, 
open tray with an open tray with a dome lid and a plastic bag cover for the cells that you're going to use or maybe you can do the soil block again you need an open tray and cover regardless of the method you need moist seedling mix the seeds the labels and a warm environment of 65 to 70 degrees well that's question now is it is it going to be warm enough you need to consider temperature in order for a seed tomato to germinate soil temperature needs to be 65 to 85 degrees you get that by using a heat mat it's nice if it could be thermostatically controlled you could leave it on 24 hours a day i do want to caution that after germination occurs it may be advisable to remove the trays from a heat mat and we'll talk about that later in today's program but your ambient temperature should be around 60 to 70 degrees. So it's in your house or in a greenhouse or a uh, some method that can be kept that warm. Also important to consider is uh, the light. Uh, new seedlings require light to grow. They, in fact, need 10 to 16 hours of light, of light per day. And that's hard to get in the spring. So think about some kind of a augmentative light system uv light ultraviolet light is is really helpful to develop strong healthy plant growth so the three things we'll talk about are the fluorescent leds or incandescent regardless of which uh, light you use you want to be able to adjust the height of that light as the plant grows you want to start at about two to three inches above the seedling and then raise it as the plant uh, height increases well, here's the first system, the uh, LED light system. Uh, generally considered the ultimate way to grow them. It's very energy efficient. It's long lasting, uh, has a wide spectrum of light, which the plants love. Uh, all those different colors affect uh, growth and the leaves uh, in different ways and are very beneficial. It doesn't produce much heat. Uh, and it comes in a wide variety of styles and sizes. Uh, the negative aspect is when you're in first investing, it is a uh, higher up, uh, higher cost up front. Then there's the fluorescent bulb, which we many of us have in our home. Uh, nice thing is it's pretty efficient. It's a uh, cheaper upfront cost. Some can produce uh, different spectrums. You'll have to kind of see others don't have quite a wide a spectrum. Uh, the negative part is it doesn't long as last doesn't last as long as the LEDs and it uses more energy than an LED. Then there's the incandescent bulb, which many of us just still have in our home. It's the cheapest uh, upfront cost. It's it's in, inefficient, and the main thing about it is it creates a heat which can dry out the soil and actually burn your plant leaves. So and it doesn't last as long in most cases. It does not have the UV rays that the fluorescent and LEDs do. Uh, and with that type of light, it can cause the plants to stretch. So it's, it's the least uh, advisable type to use. You don't have grow lights? For years, I put them in the window. And that will work fine. A nice sunny window on the south side. Try to avoid north because you need a direct light. But growing in a sunny window works just fine. Look at those plants. They're doing well. So let's get started. We've got our seedling mixed. I'm going to put a lot of moisture in to get it nice and wet. And I've got my tray to plant it in. First, I'm going to, after a couple hours of having that seedling mix moisturized, I'm going to start packing the soil into the trays. Pat it down gently. I don't want to have any holes in it. And then I'm going to make two holes in each little uh, tray. I like to plant two to increase the germination possibility and percentage. I can just use my fingers, put them down about a quarter to a third of an inch. Then I take my seeds and one per hole. And then I'll cover it with about a quarter of an inch of soil, the seedling mix. Pat it down gently. And then I'm going to make a moisten that plant mix. Take a little spritzer or a sprayer of water gently onto the surface of the seedling mix. And then the next thing to do is cover it with a, a, either a plastic bag or, bag, or if you bought a tray, they often come with covers. You need to do that to keep the, hold the moisture in. If it's on a heat tray, 
a heat mat, it will warm it up and you'll get so much evaporation in your plant, your little seedlings will never have enough moisture to germinate. So keep it covered. So here we are with the optimum setup for our traditional planting in the cells. We have a heat mat, we've got a cover, labels, and lights. Let's review a little bit about moisture. You're going to moisten the seedling mix a few hours before planting, and then you're going to moisten after you've planted it with a spritzer. Then I want to introduce the concept of bottom watering. Do that as needed when the seedlings are up and try to use a tepid water to avoid shocking the seedlings. And uh, every so often about two or three, about once or twice a week, I will add a water soluble fertilizer, dilute strength, about a quarter of the strength. And uh, when I'm trying to hydrate them, here's bottom soaking or bottom watering. Now this, this is a picture of plants further along. Your, the seedlings that you're going to be talking about in this session are much smaller not so to well developed. But this principle is that you're going to soak them in another larger pan with some tepid water. Uh, you could fertilize, add some fertilizer to that water if you wanted to. You place them in there and let it soak up the water until all of the soil in the block or cell is totally saturated. Then you'll redrain it well and return it to the uh, protected environment. This is a really superior way of watering. The plant goes to the roots, not all over the leaves, and it gets a nice thorough watering. Whether it's soil blocks or cells, we're going to get ready for the heat mat and the grow lights. And that's what's happening now. And we're going to, while we're waiting for the germinate, we've got them all set up to grow. We're going to think about walking outside and think about the garden. Where do we want to plant them? What's the location that's good? So you need to consider that as well. For a tomato to really grow healthy and to produce nice tomatoes, you need to have eight, minimum, eight hours of sun. You want to have a loamy, well-drained soil. You want to be protecting them from the wind. But you also want to avoid low spots because that's where air will stagnate, water will collect and not drain well. So uh, that's three things, four things to remember, hours of sun, the soil and the environment. Now, many of us don't have a space long enough, big enough for uh, growing in the garden. So we're going to think about using a, a container. Works very well for many tomato plants. While you're thinking about what you're going to buy for seeds, you might want to say, I need to plan about my container as well. It's best to have a fairly large one, four to five gallons per plant. It doesn't matter what it's made out of. What matters is if it's just going to allow for good drainage. There's lots of good cultivars. I've listed just a few here. Basically, what you want to do is look at some, some of the paste that are a smaller or the determinants are nice in there. And definitely the cherry tomatoes grow well and do well in a uh, pot. The nice thing is with the cherry tomatoes, uh, you can sometimes get by with just six hours of sun uh, versus the eight. But a container garden, a tomato is a wonderful plant in a container. Well, Guess what? Our seedlings have sprouted. We're going to take the dome off. There is what we see. They're looking good. Now we need to maintain the air temperature of 65 to 75 degrees. And we're going to keep the grow light two inches above the seedling. So we may have to be lifting it up. We're going to check every day for moisture and use room water, uh, room temperature water. Again, just a gentle spritzer or uh, to the soil or bottom watering if possible. Make sure that there's good airflow. You could just walk by and kind of wave your hand over them or have a light fan occasionally. Now, you might have a few problems and I have faced these, but they can easily be remedied if we know what's causing them. Look at the stems on these. There's hardly any leaf at the top, just a long spindly stem. What causes that? Leggy, spindling or Filthy seedlings can be caused by insufficient light. You see them just reaching for light. Excessive heat from the heat mat. Remember I told you earlier that when they start to sprout, take them off the heat mat. And I have left mine on too long and get long spindly stems. They don't need the heat mat so much after they've generated, they need light. <clears throat> Could be that you've got a poor growing medium or not enough moisture. 
Well, another thing that can happen is some diseases. I've had this too. This is called damping off, and you can see where the fungal disease has attacked the stem. Basically, it's going to strangle that little tomato plant so we can't get nutrients. That is called damping off. You want to prevent it. As best possible, use sterile medium and sterile pots. Try to maintain a steady temperature. Water from the bottom or sprinkle just the soil surfaces, not the leaves. If you develop it, I'm sorry to say there's no remedy. You just have to throw away plants, soil, and pots. It needs to all be discarded. Well, a good thing to remember because I remind myself of this, mistakes are tools for learning. Evaluate your trials. Making mistakes is a sign you're trying to do things better. There's usually little penalty for mistakes if you learn from them. Well, look at that. We've got good progress. You're going to notice here, there's a nice length of the stem and we have the leaves. These are called cotyledons or energy leaves and they're the first to appear. And as the plant continues to progress, it starts to produce the true leaves of that plant. You'll recognize these as um, tomato leaves. And, and now it's time to uh, take a look at the fact that it's crowded in that little pot. So it's time to thin them if there's two in a pot and you don't want to pull it out. If you pull it out, the, uh, the roots may be inter intertwined and you'll disturb the roots of the one you want to leave. So I just take a pair of scissors and cut right at the soil level. And I pick the one that looks like it's the least uh, viable. This one's not so impressive as this one. Same here, I would take this one out too. Again, I plant two per tray uh, because I want to have really good germination for not too many straight trays. And uh, that's up to you whether you want to do it, whether you have enough seeds to do that uh, or not. Check your plants regularly and often. My plants now are four to five inches tall uh, and they're going to require potting up. It's time to promote them. Um, I've made sure that they've got fertilized and watered well. Now it's time to pull one out and say, how does it look? Look at this plant. This came out of a cell and look at all those roots. This plant needs to go into a larger pot with more soil. Uh, this is the challenge of putting it into the pot because those roots have just kind of circled and circled around. Interestingly enough, look at this. This came from a soil block procedure. You don't see any of those roots. They've all been air pruned. But when this goes into another larger pot, those roots will take right off and grow and it will do very well. Well, let's just re review. Remember, don't use uh, your garden soil to start your seedlings. Possibility with pathogens, weed seeds, and it's way too compact. The soil, the seeds needs oxygen and warmth and water, and uh, they can't get that if you use your garden soil. For early feeding, dilute water-soluble fertilizer is used. Keep the seedlings close to the light source and stress them with some air circulation, a fan for get the stems uh, will be sturdier that way, just for a couple hours a day. Well, next webinar will be March 29th, and that's when we will talk about that plant that looks like this or this. Uh, I doubt your plant will look like that when we have the seminar, but we'll be ready to talk about getting it ready to, to uh, plant. Because potting up is a wonderful technique to develop a healthy plant. We'll get you ready to put it out in your garden soil, whether you, uh, whether you have bought it or have planted it. And then our third one will be planting into the garden, helping you learn the cultural practices uh, and techniques to uh, grow your plant to re minimize the risk of any disease or pests. So I hope you've enjoyed today's uh, uh, presentation. Again, growing tomatoes is uh, a wonderful experience and you can have a lot of good success. There are some, some challenges, but we want to walk you through them as we each, each one of these webinars. Uh, I've listed here in the next three slides, uh, you'll see the uh, publications from Oregon State, uh, 
as well as the uh, line, helpline address and also the address to find the videos and handouts from the 10 minute university. I've also included a couple of pages of some of the resources I've used in uh, developing this presentation. And those will be available for you to peruse when you uh, get your uh, chance to see this again as a recorded session. Well, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Amelia. Thank you, Priscilla. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, yeah, good. Okay. Sounds good. And boy, there were a lot of questions coming in and we were um, answering them, but a few really stood out. And uh, one of them is, I want to reuse my plastic containers for seedlings and repotting my plants. Do I need to disinfect them and how do I do it? Yes, I did see that question. And I remember that uh, from other classes I've taught. It is very important that you use clean everything, the clean medium, the soil medium, and definitely the pots. Um, and what you want to do is a 10% bleach solution. So that would be one part uh, bleach to one to nine parts water. And uh, just clean them out good, give a nice rinse to them at, at the end and dry them and they're ready to go. You can use them again. Nice, nice way to not have to throw them out. Right. Repurpose them. There was a lot of good um, questions and a lot of interest on the soil blocks. And one of the questions that I thought was interesting is, is there a soil block medium that is commercially available? Like, can I buy a bag that I'm going to then mix with water and then put into my soil blocks? Are you aware of anything like that? No, I'm not. And the resources that are listed in our, our resource uh, section gives recipes. And, and I really think the recipes are very broad. You can use uh, two or three or four or five or six. We used, I believe, six ingredients to make ours. Um, and I think you may be able to, because soil blocking is becoming more and more popular, there may be a way to buy a, a already prepared, prepared and packaged mix. But it's kind of fun to make your own too. Then you can get it just right. Uh, yes, but there, is, think, there are, if you, if, if you just go online and, and uh, look, search for recipes for soil blocks, you'll be surprised how they vary. So it, it basically says, uh, just get a good medium for germination. And, and also, I think in the uh, video, I stressed the importance of keeping it so that it was, the soil would stay together compact. That's the biggest challenge is, is having it fall apart because there's no container to, you know, to hold it. So the consistency is important. Okay. Great. And um, can tomatoes be grown in a hanging basket? Because they're thinking about what variety they want to buy. So I guess the first question is, can they be grown in a hanging basket? And then if so, what type of variety would you suggest? Well, I've never done this, but I imagine it could easily be done. Uh, you'd have a challenge in how you pick them and harvest them. But I would think if you compare the two different kinds, the determinate, which is a bush, and the indeterminate, which becomes a vine, uh, my experience with hanging pots is you want the vine. But if it gets to be, uh, you have to keep pruning it back if it gets to be too crazy. So it might be one that I, if I were you, I'd say, Grow one of each, put a determinate in one basket and an indeterminate in the other and see. Definitely, I would go for the uh, tomatoes that are the cherry size because they would be, uh, you know, more, more apt to be um, survive out of hanging pot as they, especially as they grow down. But it would be fun to, to see. I've never seen them, but uh, I think it would be a good test whether you want a bush. The problem with the bush, of course, is if you do prune it back, you take away where the tomatoes are going to grow. So it gets big. I would probably say an indeterminate with a vine because you can keep pruning that and still get your tomatoes. Perfect. Great. And if someone does that, would you please take a picture and send it to us at 10 yeah. Minute University? We'd love to see it. I think one caveat would be a hanging plant from, and where I hang them doesn't get a whole lot of sun the entire day. And you want your tomato to have eight hours of sun. So unless you've got it a pole that's out in the sun, you may find that you don't have enough sunshine. My my hanging pots, uh, if I don't turn them, I have a one side that's obviously doesn't get much sun, so it doesn't flower as well. So that might be a caveat is where can you hang it to get enough sun? Okay. 
I have two fertilizer questions. The first one is, <clears throat> when do I start to fertilize my new seedlings? Um, when they get to be about one to two inches or when you see the true leaves. So the cotyledons are are, you know, have gone on to be uh, the plants now producing the true leaves. And then you could use that uh, diluted uh, liquid fertilizer. Okay, and this kind of alludes to what we did last week on soil, but is organic fertilizer better than synthetic fertilizer? Is that something we want to address? Well, I'm today? just going to refer them to go back to see the, uh, the webinar that we did last Wednesday, because I talk extensively about synthetic versus organic. Um, and I think that's kind of a choice of what you have available, what your costs are, what you want to have for environmental impact. Um, I deal with it quite a bit in in that webinar last week, and that is, um, if they didn't see it, I think the link start to show up on our website under the ten minute university section. So, I did. I got a questions from someone saying that they did not get the link from last week, and they're wondering about this week. And I said it should come up. You mentioned to Priscilla in an email in a couple of days, and if not, go on our website because. Uh, you've got a whole archive of a lot of uh, webinars and handouts. Right. Okay. Another one that um, this is a problem that I've had, and you addressed it a little bit, but I get green algae-like growing on the soil when I start my tomatoes from seeds. Why is this and how do I avoid it? Well, it's a problem with watering. You're adding a uh, too much water too frequently, uh, the air might be too humid and not moving. So I would suggest letting the soil dry out just a little bit because you're just watering the plant too much and allowing that to grow on the soil. It's it's not going to keep the plant from growing, but uh, eventually it will, the plant will get big enough that uh, it'll overtake and the algae won't become a problem. But I know you don't like to see it. So uh, get also put a small fan in or at least get some air movement that's uh that's huge i find that a fan also helps my little seedlings develop nice sturdy stems because they're basically having to kind of resist this wind obviously not real strong wind but um that will help with the algae and the growth on the soil as well too much humidity too much humidity yes and um how person has a raised has a raised bed, they're wondering if it's tall enough. What do you think the size of your garden depth needs to be? Yes, I saw that question and I've helped uh, my family put tomatoes into a raised bed. I put mine in an open garden, but a raised bed usually is uh, 24 inches tall and that would give you that depth of soil. Remember that tomato roots love to grow and they love to have a lot of space. So if you were gonna put it in a raised bed and it was only 24 inches deep, I would try to give it plenty of room laterally then if it can't go too deep, depending on what your soil's like underneath your raised bed, but uh, it, give it room so that it can grow laterally. The, the health of your plant is determined by the roots. So the more room that you can give those roots, and it's surprising when you pull up a plant at the end of the season, how far those roots have gone. So a, a raised bed's fine. It, all right, but uh, you may have to water it more, obviously, with a raised bed and uh, mulch it good, but it, it should be fine, 24 inches. And I, I think that's the depth of most most raised yeah. beds. Uh, do you find that, Priscilla, you've had experience with raised beds? Yeah, so a true raised bed is connected to the native soil, meaning that it that it is connected. And so before uh, putting in any raised bed, it is a really good idea to get in there and loosen that native soil, actually dig some of that out and then um, and build it up. So, you know, that bottom is open, but just loosen it up as much, especially if you live in an area where there's some clay soil um, so that those those roots have a fighting chance to to go as deep as they want. I exactly right call you teach a, a webinar on raised beds, don't you? <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, that's, let me do one last one. How long does it take for tomato seeds to germinate? I think that's the gist of our program today. So if they do engage in this activity, what's, what's the timetable? 
Well, a lot of it depends on the environment. If it's an optimal situation, that is, you've got the temperature of the soil correct and your uh, soil medium is clean and it's uh, moist the appropriate amount, um, usually about a week, anywhere from five to nine, 10 days um, should do it. Now, if the soil is cooler, they can still germinate, but it might take a lot longer. Uh, if your soil is below 40, 50 degrees, they probably won't germinate. And if you've got it too hot, they're not going to germinate. So again, that 65 to 75 degree soil temperature, you should get your tomatoes up in a week or less. How's that? Sounds now, good. Now I will have call another caveat. There are some varieties that germinate that take longer and it'll show you that on the back of the package. So you can kind of know, oh, I should be expecting this at such and such a time. It'll, it'll say on the back of your seed packet. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I'm going to add on. Do seeds need light to germinate? I know some seeds do need light. What about tomato no, plants? No, tomatoes do not need light. They need moisture, heat, and oxygen, but they do not need light. Some seeds do, but not tomatoes. They're just, they just keep them warm and moist in a good area environment. They'll be fine. Great. Hey, will you just remind us what's going to be in volume two of your tomato webinar? What well, might they be learning about there? Yeah. So at the end of this one, you saw the little plant that was uh, growing and needed to have a new home because it had just the roots were had filled the soil. So we're going to what we call pot up. And that just means that we are going to develop a plant that is going to be so healthy with such a root structure. So we talk about potting up, not just once, but many times, as many as we can. Uh, and we also, there was a question uh, someone wrote in, wanted to know if what right they could do today to get the soil ready for their uh, transplanting out in the garden. I said, mm, too early, soil's too, too wet. And so we will talk, though, about how next session about how to get it, the think about getting your soil ready. So that's next sessions, potting up. You're still keeping them in an enclosed and protected environment. They're not ready to go out, but we do pot up in that protected environment and also think about getting the soil ready to, to go out. So that's uh, March 28th. Okay. All right. And just a reminder that um, next week's semin uh, webinar is on growing early vegetables. And so that's perfect timing because we are going to be able to start planting out um, in, a, in a couple of weeks and also about the Garden Discovery Day, which is on March 9th. That'll be fun. Okay. Enjoy uh, thinking about growing tomatoes. Okay. Thanks, Thank Priscilla. you, Amelia. So much good information. People it's are fun. very appreciative. It's fun to talk tomatoes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.